be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Incarnate Word of God, make us worthy to praise you with sincerity, to glorify you with angelic psalms, and to celebrate with purity and holiness this feast. When you were found in the temple, that we may glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the eternal Father who sent his only begotten Son for our salvation, and to the Son who today explained his teachings to the scribes and to the teachers, and to the life-giving Spirit who has spoken through the prophets and the apostles. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. Blessed are you, Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. You chose to go up to the temple with Mary and Joseph to fulfill the law of Passover which you had previously established and placed in the hands of your prophets. Today we celebrate the feast when you were found in the temple, sitting among the teachers. You taught us that God must fur be first and the last in all that we do, for our lives have no meaning except in our Lord and God. Now we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to enlighten our minds that we may understand your charity for us, which is the foundation of all your holy commandments. Strengthen our wills to act only for you, Guide our minds to think only of you, and fill our hearts with the true joy of pleasing you and doing your will. May our goal be the accomplishment of your works and those of your Father and of your Holy Spirit. To you be glory and thanks now and forever.
Glory to you, O holy God. You entered the temple as a child in order to fulfill the law. Now accept our incense and our prayers, and through them sanctify our souls and bodies, that we may become pure temples for you to dwell in us. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shout with joy from the mountains, see the temple of the Lord. Offer praise to the Lord God, its creator from of old. to the Hebrews. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, and to children forever. Brothers and sisters, if then perfection came through the Levitical priesthood on the basis of which people received the law, what need would their bill be to still have been another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not reckoned according to the order of Aaron? When there is a change of priesthood, there is necessarily a change of law as well. Now he whom all these things are said belong to a different rule and tribe of which no member ever officiated at the altar. It is clear that our Lord arose from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. It is even more obvious if another priest is raised up after the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become so, not by a law expressed in commandment concerning physical descent, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. 
For it is testified, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. On the one hand, a former commandment is annulled because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law brought nothing to perfection. On the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Praise be to God always. Alleluia. Alleluia. Why were you searching for me? Did you not know I must be in my Father's house? Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Shlomo Elokul Chudna, from the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Luke, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The evangelist Luke writes, Each year his parents went up to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the festival custom. After they had completed its days, and as they were returning, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know this. Thinking that he was in the caravan, they journeyed for a day, and they looked for him among their relatives and acquaintances. But not finding him, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, My son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been looking for you with great anxiety. But he said to them, And how is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's affairs? But they did not understand what he said to them. And he went down with them, and he came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus advanced in wisdom and in age and favor before God and man. This is the truth. Peace be with you. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, for giving us his
How is it that you sought me? In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. We can derive today or to consider two lessons from this gospel today. One natural and one supernatural. And they are about detachment and about union. There is an underlying aspect in the human heart of always seeking union. After all, we are created for God. So there is always a desire of movement, even when we're unconscious, even when we commit sin, there is still the underlying orientation of our very nature toward God. That natural foundation is actually a fundamental aspect of the despair in damnation. Because the damned are there by choice. They make choices in their lives and it is the effect of their choices. But fundamentally how they were created is towards the infinite good. So the effect that they create is a personal detestation of that good and a natural orientation that they cannot change in their creation toward that good. It is the internal rending and despair and hopelessness that is and the cause of the despair of damnation, what we call fire. And because of that union, detachment is hard. And it's one of the things which I, I think now, you would think of holiday seasons and everyone has their famous stories about the uncle at Thanksgiving or whatever. But I've always thought that part of the reason why there can be this family bickering and arguments is not just because of people's characters. It's just because we have the desire for it to be perfect. We have the desire for our, our family to be one. We have a desire for this affection and this union, which inevitably is never going to work because we live in this valley of tears. And that disappointment is part of what already causes, I would say even circumstantially, the misunderstandings that take place within families. So having considered these things, there is both a natural and a supernatural lesson that we can take from the finding in the temple. This is the third dolor of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the loss of Jesus. So those who practice the devotion of the seven sorrows of Our Lady, considering the things that take place in her life, this is one of them, the loss of the child. But of course, the finding of the child is the fifth joyful mystery of the rosary. And it is a profound mystery because our Lord is actually entering the very temple that he himself called for its creation. That when he makes the holy of holies under the law of Moses, it's empty. It has the Ark of the Covenant in it. But as far as any representation of God, there's nothing there. It's an empty space. And now it is the God himself the invisible God who appears as a child. It's in our Husoyo this morning. That God appears as a child in his own temple to take possession. He appears among them to bring that word of prophecy, to speak to the teachers. And so when they're amazed, they're not amazed because they find our Lord at the temple. After all, they've just been there for the Passover. But they're amazed by this interaction that's going on between the rabbis and our Lord. Now our Lord at the age of 12, he's bar mitzvah. He's a son of the law. He is in a religious sense considered to be an adult. And that's why the rabbis, the teachers don't have a problem speaking to this boy slash young man. But what they're amazed by is how he asks the questions and the answers that he gives. And surely what our Lord is doing is linking the prophecies of the old law together by asking as a 12 year old, but if as you say, Rabbi, it's this, then how does it connect with this prophecy? And the rabbi will answer that one. But if that is true, then how do those two reconcile with this third prophecy? And it's very, it's very possible that someone like Hillel, who's going to be, or Nicodemus, these people, of course, 30, 20 years from now will be people that approach our Lord, Nicodemus being one who does. But these men would have been younger rabbis at the time. 
Who knows that if when they come to visit our Lord, they're in their 50s or 60s. That means they're young rabbis in their 30s at the time. And so our Lord is preparing the territory as God of the prophetic word teaching them. And Mary and Joseph seeing this, they marvel at This is what they're amazed by. Because, of course, they know who this child is. They know the origin of this child. But it is now that our Lord begins really to assert his place. That's why I say we have these lessons about detachment, both natural and supernatural. On a new natural level, we can actually just make a remark and go on. Which is, we used to historically see ourselves as responsible to begin to steer our children from that age of 12 onwards to a life to help them discern where they're supposed to be going, what they're supposed to be doing. And it's historically just the way they worked. In the Roman Empire, in the classical empire, when you hit seven or eight, that's it. You're in the hands of your father. He oversees your education. Your mom did great. She gets the first eight years. He gets the second eight. You move it. And the idea that you begin this detachment, but of course, we live in a world in which that's even more difficult. In the classical world, and certainly in the Christian world, parents saw themselves as receiving the gift of life, of which they were only guardians for a moment. And let's face it, when the children are babies and they're screaming all night long, it's a really long day. Time goes on slowly. And then you turn around and they're gone. And you lament that loss of your little ones because then you realize that that initial education and that life of 15, 20 years was actually very short. So that's always been a problem in a sense, always been a pain of the human heart. But we make it more complicated in the modern culture. We, not meaning necessarily us who are in this building, but culturally, we have begun to look at children as being a possession like other things. And it's not a possession. The children who are given to us are given to us for a moment as guardians. And we all know that because we've become adults. And as we become adults, our parents will always be our parents. We always respect them. But they also become other adults. And you have a different relationship, even though fundamentally and historically it's still parental. You start moving to a level in which not equality, but certainly of a proximity of an understanding of life as you move along. And yes, emotionally, you're 120 years old and your son is 85, he's still your baby. Yes, I know that emotionally. But in the modern world, and you've heard people talk this way, they're married, they've been married for years, and they'll tell you, oh, we're just not ready to have children yet. We need to do this, we need to do that, my husband needs this promotion. Well, God bless them if they can say, even say husband these days. Usually it's whoever I'm shacked up, my partner, whatever. But the vision is still the same of, well, once that promotion comes and we have this or that's in the account, then we will have a child. They speak as if they're talking about a cocker spaniel. We're just not ready yet. The apartment's too small. We can't let the dog out. There's no run room. So we need to do this, this, and this, and this, and then we will allow life to come in. That attitude can only be there because we see it as being a possession. And we make life actually much harder. And we stunt and destroy our children, which is why you have all these 25 and 35-year-olds who are still living in their parents' basement. It's, it's unbelievable. This has never happened in the history of the world where you have children who are just still there always. But it's because we've also stunted them because at 10 and 12, we haven't started orienting them to become independent individuals in the world. Mine. Mine. So one of the lessons that our Lord gives here to Mary and Joseph, as holy as they are, is to, that's their only child. There is no other experience before this. This is it. And so the child himself is teaching them, you must me allow me to be about my father's affairs, which is really what the Greek is saying. It could mean in our father's house. My, it's, it's among my father's things is what it literally means. I must be doing my father's will. It's in the kolo. I feel within my heart that I must accomplish my father's will. So that's just one lesson for us, is to understand really what our relationships are 
personally on a level, even familial. But on a supernatural level, it's even more profound. Because here our Lord is teaching us the progress of the spiritual life. We talk about it a bit in the bulletin here. We've considered it here and there during these last few weeks, but usually during the week. So not everybody's there. But there are is a progress not only in human life physically, but there is a progress in the spiritual life also. And the spiritual life God initiates by grace. And God calls to every individual to enter into this relationship and to move into the divinity. That is, after all, the reason for which we were created. You see the prayer in the Husoyo. You taught us to live by life, by grace and faith, because human life without grace, without the Lord God, has no value. It has no meaning unless it is moving towards its fulfillment of faith and grace. So read the Husoyo again. All of these little ideas are here. Little ideas, not little at all. They're enormous ideas. What is the meaning of human life? It is the sad part when we go on and on about human dignity, and there is human dignity. But as in the Husoyo says, that human dignity without grace and faith has no meaning. It becomes stunted. The people in hell are also human, but they have obscured that dignity and they have lost the value of why they were created because they chose to refuse grace and faith. So what our Lord is teaching here is that our life of moving toward God in that union that we talked about for which we were created, that grace has to be responded to. It has to be received. But as I've often said, grace burns. Because grace is making us become something than what we were when we were simply born from our mother's womb. To make us become greater than what we would be otherwise by just sitting in our living room. To move us continually, which is why there are stages to the spiritual life. I compare it in the bulletin today to infancy and adolescence and maturity. We call them the three stages of the spiritual life. We've talked about it, I think, about a year and a half ago. But this is exactly what this child, he is bar mitzvah. He is considered spiritually already within the adult world. And when his parents are there, they're doing what is completely correct. They are terrified at the loss of their child. That is completely, humanly, totally understandable. But you have to also remember that among them, they are going to have the sense that they've done something wrong because they know who this child is. Have we offended God in some way that he has now separated himself from us? This is part, not just an emotional fear and anxiety that Our Lady speaks about, but it is also because they are both very holy. The idea that somehow we've offended, somehow we have failed, somehow we have done something wrong here. That is part of this mystery, that they have somehow failed religiously. And notice that the feast is Passover. Passover is the movement from one place to another, from slavery to freedom, from the paganism of Egypt to the God of Mount Sinai. It is a movement, which is why we know that that is part of the lesson in this mystery, is our spiritual life, that how we move forward, so that in our infancy, in the spiritual life, it is purgative, it is ascetic, it is the thing we have to make. Ascetic just means effort in Greek. We have to make the effort. We do it in a human manner. It's our discipline, our morning prayers, our night prayers. We have our routines. We pray, we do these things. We try not to do those things. We try to do the opposite in virtue. That is the purgative life. That is the ascetic life. We work to make it become ours. And it is a collaboration by grace. It's infused virtues, but it's our will that has to be disciplined because we are cantankerous by our birth of original sin. We are ornery. And so that will has to be tamed and brought in, but that's the purgative state. But as you move along into the greater state, which is that which characteristic is infused contemplation of adolescence, the illuminative state, we call it for that reason, you must pass through the dark night of the senses. You must have the senses be purified themselves because as human beings, everything we know and we see comes from other senses. Everything we know comes through sense experience. 
Right? We like sense experience. That's why it's easy for us to eat three Big Macs and drink, you know, two Super Gulp whatevers. It's easy for us to do that because our senses are like, ooh, we like this. And now with brain research, we know the brain just gets bathed with all these hormones. And all of that is wonderful in creation because we have all of whatever, our endomorphins or whatever these things are. All of these things are there. And it's wonderful the way God has created us. But because it's just part of, part of our nature, when we live only at that level, we're not really being the people that we are meant to be. And so you have the stage which is known as the dark night of the purification of the senses to begin to detach us from the sense experiences. Because as St. John of the Cross reminds us, as long as we live in that, the faith is a question of grace of the hidden God. It is a faith to see the invisible as if it were visible. That is not a sense experience. And so as St. John of the Cross reminds us, to the degree that we rely upon sense experience within our faith, the faith never grows. We become stunted. It's why we all know Catholics who love Christmas and are never there again for any other part of the year. It's Christmas, oh, it sparkles, it glitters, it's pretty. We like it and you give me stuff. Of course we like that. It's like the two-year-old. It's not complicated. It doesn't take any requirement of that you haven't moved through the ascetic life. You haven't moved through this. And certainly have not moved through the dark night of the senses. The person who's always seeking and defining religion as being emotional consolation has, has never moved through any of the detachment through the dark night of the senses. They have not moved on. They stay spiritually retarded. They be held back in infancy at best, if not just living in mortal sin. So that illuminative state is only the second stage of the life. When our Lord is teaching them, you have to understand who I am. I am your child, but I am so much more than just your child. That's why he says to them, we quoted the beginning of the sermon, how is it that you sought me? What is the manner, why were you looking for me? Was it pure emotion? Was it simply a paternal concern, a parental concern? Or do you not know that I must be about my father's business? We are meant to be moving higher. This is a great purification of Joseph and Mary as they move deeper into the spiritual life, which is why we're told by St. Luke, she keeps all of these things in her heart. We're told first, they do not understand what he's saying. That is a dark night. When you move through the spiritual life in which it all becomes bitter and dry, when it all becomes difficult, but you hang on because the light of the faith pulls you through that darkness, it is not easy. Then neither is growing up easy. We all thought it was exhilarating to be high school kids, and none of us would go back and do it again, would we? It is the same thing in the dark night of the senses. You move through something that you would never want to repeat again, but you're glad that you did it because it moves you in that maturity. They did not understand, but Mary continues to ponder this reality within her heart. And the final stage that you move into, which is that consciousness of God's presence at every moment, habitually in our lives, the life what we call unitive, which is by its very definition part of the deification that we move toward. In order to arrive there, you must go through a second purgations of the dark night of the spirit. And that is when everything becomes dark, when you don't even know that you have the faith because everything is bitter and dry. For St. Francis of Assisi, he seems to have gone through that final stage, that stage for about two years to go to mass every day, to labor week after week, to practice the virtues when all it is is darkness, confusion. I won't say despair. It's not despair because the virtues are still working, but on a human level, we have been purged from everything and we live only by the grace of God. That is adulthood in the spiritual life. And every single one of us, I, you, all of us are called to that. That is meant to be the normal development of our spiritual life. So these detachments of the dark night of the senses, the dark night of the spirit, they are part of what our Lord is teaching by staying back in Jerusalem. He knows exactly what this will do to his parents. 
This is how God works. God is not a big lollipop. And God has a perfect understanding that the things that he asks us to do hurt. But the hurt is not the purpose. The hurt winds up becoming a condition because we are not perfect. And to move deeper into the light requires us to move away from what is purely material and purely sense experience. So there is a profound lesson. People sometimes will wonder, well, the kid was lost, they found him three days later, that's a mystery. Yes, it is a mystery. To understand all the things that are actually going on within it, it is a profound teaching moment. This is why that teaching moment that is given to Mary and Joseph is the same kind of teaching moment that our Lord is giving to the rabbis. He is teaching all of these people simultaneously by doing one thing, staying in Jerusalem. And his staying back is a detachment necessarily. And so in this festival of lights, during this season of Christmas and the Epiphany, it is for a moment to us to consider what our paths are supposed to look like as we move forward in our Catholic lives. They will not always be yippee yahoo attitudes. They will not always be sweet and consoling in the sense of emotions. But consolation is not about emotions. Consolation is that which establishes us with the greater conviction to serve the Lord God. And in that understanding, which is the classical understanding, not emotions, the classical understandings of consolation is those dark nights become the very foundation of consolation as we walk through pain. This is why God himself finishes his lesson by dying on Calvary. And the references are made to our Lord's death already as we celebrate Christmas, already the things to come, because our Lord entered into the world for that purpose, death and resurrection, detachment and union. They bring about the fulfillment of what we were created for and what we are called to be by grace. So may the Lord God unleash that unity and unleash that detachment among each one of us, that we may become the children of God that we are meant to be. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Sylvester. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Continuing in Afro St. John Chrysostom 876. 
876. The anaphora of St. John on 815, 815. 815, I'm sorry. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Lord God and Father, you are true love, security that is ever sure, and hope that never fails. Grant love, happiness, and everlasting peace to your children here before you. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and souls, and with a holy kiss worthy of your blessed name, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith which is pleasing to God. before your majesty send us your grace and glorious blessings from the heights of your heavenly sanctuary that we may glorify you your only son and your holy spirit now and forever Amen. O lord you sent your beloved son at the appointed time for our salvation and he gave us these holy and life-giving mysteries do not look upon us as strangers, and do not turn your holy face away from us because of our many sins. For you alone are the Holy One with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> the love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just to praise you, O Lord of all in heaven and on earth. The powers on high in the heavens where they dwell glorify you. The fiery ranks exalt you, the cherubim bless you, and the seraphim worship you. They cry out and they proclaim. Kyrie eleison, 
وبيومو حاجتم حشون اللي ما بد خايم انسام لحم من قولي شنتو وبارخ وقادش وقسون يا بل ترميده وقارو مارم سابخو لمهني كل خون حونون دنيته فخرو ديل دخلو فايكون وحلو ساقيم ما تخسيو ما تيهم خسون يوم خومي وخوي للعلم علمين خدایتو دخلو فای کن وخلو ساگیم تشر و میتی هب خوصون خامه و خای دان قلم علمین body and drink this blood you proclaim my death until I come again we remember your death O Lord we profess your resurrection we await your second coming we implore your mercy and compassion we ask for the forgiveness of sins may your mercy rest upon us Christ our God, we remember your plan of salvation and we implore your goodness. When you come in glory with your holy angels and all await the reward they deserve. And when you place the sheep to the right and the goats to the left, do not look upon us as strangers to your household and do not turn your holy face away from us. Do not let our sins and offenses pierce your holy heart, and do not separate us from you. For we have professed your holy name, and have proclaimed your divinity. Rather treat us according to your promises. Forgive our sins, pardon us, and have mercy upon your inheritance. For this your repentant church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. Amen. 
Lam zo kho dam ko so no di mo di le dam shi kho alo ho di lan May these holy mysteries sanctify the bodies and souls of those who share in them Cleanse their hearts, purify their thoughts And be a pledge of the heavenly kingdom and new life forever O oh Lord, we now remember in this sacrifice all the holy churches and the shepherds of the true faith, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Richard Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops. With them, we remember the priests, the deacons, and all who serve your church. We pray to you, O oh Lord. For the peace and stability of the whole world, for a blessed and prosperous year, for an abundant harvest, for the sick and the oppressed, for all who call upon your holy name on land, at sea, or in the air, and who profess that you are the true God, we pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, those who have presented the offering upon this altar, and those who desired to do so but were unable, and grant them their petitions. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We remember all the saints, the fathers, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, Mary, the mother of God, Saint Joseph, Saint Jude, St. Sylvester, and all the righteous and the just. Through their prayers, make us worthy to stand among them. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, in your grace, those who have left us and have gone to you from the first Christian disciples to this day. They were signed with the seal of baptism and received the precious body and blood of your Son. They wait for you in your life-giving hope. Raise them up on the last day and in your mercy forgive all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. pleasing oblation, who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice, who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest, who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory. O 
God the Father, you accept prayers and you answer petitions. You have taught us, through your beloved Son, to stand before you and to call upon you with pure souls and clear consciences, praying, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation and from harm of evil. For you have power over all, and we raise glory to you now and forever. Shlomo Ilukulukun. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, in your grace and abundant mercy, bless those who bow before you. Make us worthy to share in your life giving mysteries and to join the assembly of your saints that with them we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make, Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by
again and again we thank you, O Lord. We raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Gracious God and Father, how can we repay you for your goodness and for the salvation you have just given us, who can give you the glory you truly deserve? In our weakness, and insofar as we are able, 
We worship, praise, and thank you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo el Lekurchunna. Jesus Christ, our God, we worship, thank, and praise you. We implore your goodness and abundant mercy for the salvation of the whole world, for the protection of the living and eternal rest of the departed, for the feeding of the hungry and the support of the needy, for the visiting of the sick and the consolation of the grieving. Through your grace dwell in them, and by your abundant mercy give them life. By your cross bless your people and protect your inheritance. Adoration is due to you and to your Father and to your holy and life-giving Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.